Welcome to the Joy of Depression. We're going to do a three-part workshop today. What I'm hoping is you'll have a better understanding of ways to think about depression, common variables associated with depression, and strategies for responding to the experience of depression. Some years ago I was intrigued by an article that alluded to the benefit of depression. From an evolutionary standpoint, why has depression existed for thousands of years? Any thoughts? It slows you down. It slows you down. And again, from an evolutionary standpoint, maybe there's some benefit to slowing down, especially in a fast-paced world. Any other thoughts? The benefits of depression. Maybe it's just part of the human experience, part of our emotional way we make sense of the world. Part of the human experience. If you think about the father of evolutionary biology, Charles Darwin, he described in his pretty thorough journals his experience with mental fits. His depression left him, quote, not able to do anything one day out of three, close quote. In fact, he despaired his weakness of mind, saying, the race is for the strong. I shall probably do little more but be content to admire the strides others make in science. <laughs> Interesting, his perception of this mental state. He also said, work is the only thing which makes life endurable to me. It was his sole enjoyment in life. He was given to bouts of crying whenever he was left alone by his wife. Quite a struggle. Probably would fit today's definition of major depression. For Darwin, and I quote from Jonah Lehrer, depression was a clarifying force, focusing the mind on its most essential problems. Pain or suffering of any kind, he wrote, if long continued causes depression and lessens the power of action, yet it is well adapted to make a creature guard itself against any great or sudden evil. It leads an animal to pursue that course of action which is most beneficial. Fascinating. So let's use that as a frame for our discussion and let's talk about shifting our focus when we think about mood. So who do we have in here that's a psychology major? Okay, good. Tell me your name, please. Um, I'm Monica Moser. Monica, tell us a little bit about your understanding of depression. What model of depression makes most sense to you? Um, what I've learned about depression is that there's a chemical imbalance in the brain that causes it and also um, that it's affected by what we do. Um, I've also learned that, um, or at least I've heard that doing things is the best way to get yourself out of a slump, out of a, a depressive episode um, that, what's that called? Oh, maybe it'll come back to me. Activation behavioral Yeah, that kind of thing. That's not what I'm looking for, but I'm sure that's the same kind of thing that I'm talking about. Doing things, getting out of your um, little circle of comfort mm -hmm. um, is the best way to get yourself out of one of those episodes. So I heard, I heard three dimensions that you referenced. First, the biological, that there's a hereditary component. And we know from research that like most human characteristics, we can explain about half of the likelihood of depression based on our genetic endowment alone, our DNA. So there is something of a hereditary link when we talk about major depression. And in fact, there seems to be something related to serotonin, one of those key neurotransmitters that influences the symptoms or the presentation of depression. So a biological model. You also mentioned something of a cognitive model that we get into a mindset. We have these negative frames, what we call schema, ways of looking at things that seem to shape our experience of depression. And then you talked about a behavioral component. If we can just get out and do something. The irony is that with major depression, the energy to get out of bed and go do something different 
is missing. And so we have that learned helplessness where we feel nothing we do is going to make a difference anyway. Other thoughts besides maybe a biological or a cognitive or a behavioral way of explaining depression? John? Maybe sometimes when people don't feel a sense of purpose or mission in their life, they kind of feel like life is meaningless. Sure. Then they, they get into a slump, but then when they have something to live for, something they believe in, they become more activated. So more of an existential approach to understanding, a humanistic model. If we reach our ideal, if we meet some purpose in life, we're less likely to experience depression. But if we question our purpose, then we are more prone to feel discouraged and depressed. Other ways of thinking about depression? I think about Angela. it in terms of, um, sometimes, in terms of the systems that we live in, whether it's, you know, social supports and, you know, family, friends, you know, the people in our lives, or whether it's maybe parts of our identities where we experience oppression in society. I think that those things can contribute to depression as well, not having adequate supports and or uh, facing oppression. And certainly from a social or social cognitive perspective, we learn depression, uh, particularly if it's more likely to occur within a family system. We can model the behavior of a depressed parent and become depressed ourselves. Uh, we can perceive that our status or worth, importance in that system is less than what we think it should be or could be, leaving us more exposed to feelings of worthlessness, lack of importance. Or we can learn, again, that notion of helplessness, that no matter what we do, it's really not going to make a difference anyway. And so we stay stuck in whatever behaviors that seem to be contributing to our depression. Other ideas? about a way of thinking about depression or depressed mood. Yeah. Well, yeah, you just have, I think, anger turned in there at the top. And I think it, you know, for some people, that may be how they respond to the emotions is that they bottle them up. And whether it's anger or others, that, that could contribute potentially to depression and other psychological you know, problems in their life because they're not getting that anger out or that uh, expressing that emotion in, in a healthier way. Sure. And that was Papa Freud's notion was that we don't have the capacity to express our depression. And so anger is a more uh, accessible emotion. We can take that emotion and use it to beat ourselves up and experience self-condemnation and a sense of depression. So regardless of which model you use, a psychodynamic, a behavioral, humanistic, cognitive, social cognitive, or biological model of depression, you can try to make sense of the experience you're having. I handed you a Beck depression inventory. It's a really simple scale. And um, what I think would be useful would be to take just a couple minutes and assess our situation. And so anyone that participates in the workshop could do a similar type of evaluation. We're going to take the 21 items on the Beck Depression Inventory and collapse them into about nine areas. And there's a simple way. If you think again about Sigmund Freud, just think about Siggy caps. Since I'm from Counseling and Psychological Services, just think of Papa Freud working in our counseling center. You can think of Siggy caps. Okay. And the S would stand for sleep. So as you think about the Beck Depression Inventory, what item gets it sleep? Can you find that one? 16. Number 16. And so what are our options as we think about how depression might impact our experience of sleep? Sleeping more or less than is, is normal and sure. healthy. Place. Trouble falling asleep trouble staying asleep, um, if you wake up, trouble getting back to sleep, or sleeping an excessive number of hours. For most adults, especially college students, seven and a half hours is ideal. Some get by with as few as six, some require as many as nine. But if you're sleeping 10, 12 hours a day, or if you're getting you know, fewer than four and a half hours of sleep a day, certainly quality sleep, 
most likely that's going to affect some of the other symptoms we would expect related to depression. Sleep, such a common dimension related to depression. Okay, and the I stands for? Interest. Thanks, Merle. So would your experience with depression tend to heighten or decrease your interest? I would say decrease. Generally motivated. speaking, that's what happens. The things that we used to love doing and enjoy, for example, one of the things you really enjoy doing? Reading. And for someone who is severely depressed, reading may? Not be interesting anymore, not be motivated to do it. Sure. And so the, the uh, benefit of that part of your life is lost. And so the downward spiral continues. Do you see anything on the Beck Depression that gets at interest level? Loss of pleasure? Loss of pleasure. We call it anhedonia. The things that we used to find really pleasant no longer have the same value to us. So sleep and interest. And then we get to the G for? Guilt or worry, stress. And that's why the relationship between anxiety and depression is pretty close. We see a lot of overlap because there is a tendency to experience heightened guilt or worry, stress, anxiety when we are depressed. <coughs> um, any thoughts about common areas of guilt for college students? Not studying enough. Not studying enough. I was going to say that. Procrastinating. Procrastination. Not doing well on tests. Not performing well. Worrying about whether you're going to pass a class. And if you don't pass this class or you don't pass this exam, then you're not going to be accepted in your program. If you're not accepted in your program, then you're going to be a failure in life. And this cascading pattern of thoughts, uh, catastrophizing, seems to be a common feature related to severe depression. And those who are in significant relationships, guilt over not investing in others, being selfish because you have to put so much time and energy into school. So there's a variety of things you can feel bad about and that tends to be a common feature of major depression. So we have sleep, interest, guilt, energy. energy. So the E, the big E, a, a serious decline in energy in part because you're not sleeping well and so you're tired all the time not having the will to get out of bed in the morning, to do much of anything. And so the things that you used to enjoy, whether it was school or some other activity, loses its pleasure for you. Any other thoughts about energy and the impact or influence of energy levels on your experience with mood? You can almost kind of see it when somebody's just kind of down, when they're up and then when they're down. Down. You notice it in body posture, yeah. you notice it in gait, you certainly notice it in facial expression, okay? Voice. In voice. Person starts to speak almost in slow motion. Good, good insight. Um, and then the C for concentration. Anyone struggle with concentration in school? Staying focused? Now concentration can have a variety of causes disruptions in concentration can be a function of an attention deficit, but more often uh, our problems related to focus have to do with mood and especially the experience of depression. And then related, another physiological experience, appetite. Any thoughts about, as you look at the back depression inventory, changes in appetite that might occur? It could go either way. It goes either way, just like sleep. Sleeping too much or not enough. Overeating, which then reinforces feelings of guilt. I'm such a slob, I'm such a fat pig, and that idea that I'm, I'm disgusting. Or completely losing appetite, not having the energy to fix a decent meal or to eat. And then as we lose weight, um, again, we start to uh, have less capacity to exercise and get the energy we need to perform the normal things that we do day to day. The psychomotor slowing is really interesting, and I think John alluded to it. We start to go in slow motion. And then there are really two S's. Uh, we see a, a decrease in libido, or our sexual drive, but also in suicidal thought, an increase in suicidal thought. 
And what's interesting is most folks who are severely depressed don't really want to die. What do they want? Relief. Relief. Attention. Attention. Just want to feel better. Some kind of escape and, and just to feel better. And so often the, the thoughts of perishing, the thoughts of death, really are a function of just wanting to escape this pit of despair. Uh, there are some video illustrations of that, and I think we'll look at one just for the sake of illustration. Um, how many of you have seen Dead Poet Society? Excellent. Do you remember the two characters that are kind of the protagonists of the story, Todd and Neil? Neil is the aspiring actor whose father wants him to uh, either be an attorney or a physician, preferably med school. And Neil is an excellent student, but his passion is acting. And Todd, the extremely insecure young man who comes from a family of privilege, but also a family of neglect. And on Todd's birthday, for his 16th birthday, his parents, instead of giving him a new car or something he might enjoy, he receives a desk set, the same pen and pencil set that he got the year before, which he didn't like the first time. So how does Neil respond to Todd's depressed state? Is anybody probably hard to remember back to this scene? Maybe we could watch just a brief clip and, and then talk about it. But as you, as you notice, Neil does something pretty exciting. He reframes Todd's experience. Do you remember, John, what he does with that? Well, he, he, does, a, he does a few things. I think he, he uh, I liked how he talked about it getting used as a, as a toy or as a Frisbee kind of making light of it, kind of to take it not so seriously, not so heavy. Yeah. So he takes that situation and he turns it into an opportunity to express emotion. In this case, to launch the pen and pencil set. And then my favorite line, I wouldn't worry. They'll probably give you another one next year. So this idea that instead of being discouraged or depressed by the situation, he reframes it. And I think that that's really the joy of depression, that no matter what happens, um, we can redefine what those aspects or variables associated with depression mean. And so the benefit of, of rumination or thinking about the same thing over and over again is that after a time, if we think about it enough, it can come to mean something new for us. In this case, that uh, there's an opportunity to express my frustration and anger rather than just sit with my sadness and disappointment. And the reason Neil is able to help Todd is because first, in just a really simple gesture, he says, oh, just that verbal acknowledgement, how disappointing this birthday gift must have been for you, oh. And then once he's established that empathy, he's able to say, Todd, I think you underestimate the power of this death set and can help him see another way to think about it. So let's look at some of those variables that help to define depression. In this particular <coughs> situation, what were the factors that contributed to Todd's temporary depression? Being let down by his parents. Being let down. Yeah. And do, does anyone know what that feels like? To be let down, to be discouraged, disappointed? Kind of a universal experience, isn't it? And so the situation itself isn't really the key variable. The key variable is how we interpret the situation and what we make of it, how we respond to it. And that's the joy of depression. That one of the benefits of being an adult that's different than being a child is we have more capacity to respond to disappointing situations. Sometimes as children, we feel stuck. And that's how we learn helplessness. It doesn't really matter what I do. It's probably not going to make a difference. As opposed to, um, I'm going to launch 
this disappointing gift and celebrate my birthday the way I want to celebrate it rather than in the way my parents want me to celebrate it. Okay? Um, trauma is another aspect of the whole depressive experience. If you look at recent research, they're doing research now on post-traumatic growth. Instead of post-traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic growth. Reframing even the horrors of war or the difficulty of rape and uh, child abuse, framing those experiences as opportunities for growth rather than handicapping me for life. And, and so learning to understand the situation from a different frame. Um, we've talked a little bit about serotonin, but I do want to talk about the fact that sometimes when the depression is severe enough, we need a boost, an energy boost, something to help us sleep, something to help us concentrate, something to help restore our appetite, our sexual drive, our will to live, so that we can find joy in the things that are growth producing. That's the role of medication. Medication alone has not been shown to be very effective. Medication coupled with a change in thought, support from counseling, uh, other interventions is very effective. And so when we know that the variables or symptoms of depression are related to our heredity, her hereditary uh, variables and our DNA, then sometimes a trial of antidepressant medication can be really effective. But the one I want to spend just a few minutes on is the power of thought, the importance of rumination. And so I want to uh, give you an excerpt from literature and just ask you to ruminate for a moment. Ponder uh, how you might respond to the situation. Who's read The Count of Monte Cristo? Or maybe seen the movie? All right. So one of my favorite chapters is the chapter uh, where Dante's, Edmond Dante uh, tunnels his way into the adjoining prison cell. As you remember, Edmund has been falsely accused of a crime and basically imprisoned for life with no hope of any parole. How would you feel? Pretty miserable. Pretty miserable. Bitter? Absolutely. Probably. <laughs> Probably. Depressed? Helpless, yeah. <laughs> Certainly help us because it's, it's, it's a fortress, an island fortress, and so the likelihood of escape is kind of like Alcatraz. The likelihood of escape is, is extremely remote. And so he goes through a state of depression, stops eating, and just about perishes. But on occasion he hears the prisoner next door. And so eventually he, he tunnels his way into the next prison cell and meets an abbey who has been a, a monk, who has, has been in uh, prison for many, many years. Now, if you had been in prison for many, many years, your thought might be, what am I doing here? Why continue living? Sure, sure. It would be easier just to die. Listen to uh, what... Edmund learns. He starts sneaking in. He learns the, the prison routine. And so he knows when he's free to go somewhere without the guards discovering. And so on a daily basis, he goes next door and is instructed. And he learns foreign language. He learns mathematics and science. He learns philosophy. And after a time, after many months, even years, he finally has this conversation with the monk. He says, I was reflecting, replied Dantes, upon the enormous degree of intelligence and ability you must have employed to reach the high perfection to which you have attained. What would not you have accomplished if you had been free? Wouldn't you share those sentiments? You meet this brilliant man and you think, wow, what could this guy have accomplished if he hadn't been locked up in this prison cell for the past decade? And the response. This is the power of thought. Possibly nothing at all. 
the overflow of my brain would probably, in a state of freedom, have evaporated in a thousand follies. Misfortune is needed to bring the, to light the treasures of the human intellect. Compression is needed to explode gunpowder. Captivity has brought my mental facilities to a focus, and you are well aware that from collision of clouds, electricity is produced. From electricity, lightning, and from lightning, illumination. And so in this strange way, his mentor is teaching him that captivity has focused him to develop his mind, to learn more than he ever would have learned had he been wasting his time on the outside. And so he goes about learning as much as he can before he eventually escapes. And uh, I'll let you read the rest of the story. But it's a great story about how Edmund reframes his whole experience. And as you know in the story, by the end of the story, he says, life can be summarized in two words. Do you know what those two words are? If you're going to summarize life in two words, how might you summarize them? Do good. Do good. Those are great words. I like that. Anyone else? Fully live. Fully live. That's perfect. Edmund comes up with wait and hope. And I think one of the uh, things we learned from The Road Less Traveled, if you've read M. Scott Peck, is that the two most important things we learn in this life is that life is difficult, therefore pain is good, and we must delay gratification. That whole notion of waiting and hoping. So consider the value of depression in teaching us patience and refining our sense of hope. What's also fascinating, one last variable I want to touch on and ask your impression about. Why do you think twice as many women as men are depressed across the last hundred years, literally thousands of studies, and cross-culturally? In almost every study on rates of depression, twice as many women as men are depressed. Maybe because the men don't want to admit they're depressed? Possibly, although they've controlled for that variable. But that certainly is an is a interesting theory. Other theories of the predominance of depression amongst women? I think maybe because it's more acceptable for women to be depressed or sad or, you know, to show those emotions. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but maybe. Sure, there are certainly social and cultural variables that make emotional expression more uh, desirable. Maybe. Acceptable for women. Yeah, well, maybe well, women might continue thinking, oh, I'm depressed, and men might say, That's, I can't be sad right now. I've, I've just got to go out there and pretend so like I'm not, and maybe their actions will mm -hmm. get them out of it. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Good thought. Anything physiologically that might distinguish men and women in terms of accessing their emotional experience? A woman's corpus callosum, on average, is about how much larger than a man's? That's that connective tissue between the right and left hemisphere. About 38% larger. And so a woman's capacity to, in a sense, communicate between the feeling brain and the thinking brain, between the rational and emotional component of their central nervous system, is considerably greater. And so accessing emotional experience is probably easier for women. So it's a blessing and sometimes a challenge associated with that. And then uh, definitely from a biological standpoint, so in terms of some of the uh, hormonal changes related to pregnancy and, and childbirth, there's a tendency to be exposed to some of those symptoms of depression more often than men. So a variety of reasons. Uh, because of that, I think it's really important to consider how we think about that experience. If as men or women we're exposed to depression in ourselves or those we care about, what are some of those thought patterns that might help us benefit 
from depression, like the Abbey, who discovers the possibilities of being in prison and not just the uh, hopelessness of being in depression. So let's, let's consider that for just a moment. Um, let's take any activating event and let's learn the ABCs of understanding and experience. And we'll call A the activating event. So does anybody have an event that they found maybe somewhat discouraging or depressing? Not too personal, but if you have a real experience, it'll make the illustration more useful. Please. Um, in high school, I tried out for the top band um, as a junior, and I didn't make it, and I was really disappointed. Sure. So, so potentially, that could be really depressing. And I was pretty depressed for a few days after that, but yeah. Yeah, because you believed at point B. Um, I believed it was my fault because I talked myself into thinking I couldn't do it, and I was going to mess up, and then I did, and I beat myself up over that. And, yeah, you know. okay. And so the emotional consequence of that was? I felt really bad. <laughs> you felt bad. Yeah. And I think what we forget sometimes is the importance of that belief system. Sometimes we see the event trying out for the select band, and we know the emotional consequence, feeling really bad. And so we assume that the reason we feel really bad is that we didn't get selected for the band or the performing group. Not realizing that it was our assumptions, our beliefs, our attitudes about that event that really drove that bad feeling. If you had shifted your beliefs or assumptions to... <coughs> I don't know. <laughs> I thought that was pretty being honest with myself, so... It could have been. It could have been that you just... If I had maybe said, okay, well, that's what happened, but I can't change that right now. Right. Maybe I would have let up on myself a little bit sooner. Sure. Um, all eight of our children tried out for numerous roles throughout their childhood and adolescence, um, both in, in terms of musical theater and opera and a variety of venues, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully. And what I observed in each of their disappointment, whether it lasted and spiraled into kind of an ongoing depression or whether it was very temporary, was what they told themselves about the audition process. Okay. That sounds right. <laughs> our, our youngest son was in a commercial, and uh, it was really a cute commercial. He was very young, and, and because he had this initial success, he just assumed every time that he tried out for some production, he was automatically going to get it. And, and initially, that was the case. He was in the Utah Festival Opera as Tom Thumb, and he, he had all these roles. He was Oliver and, and had... had Tremendous success. And then the first time he tried out for a movie, he didn't get the part. How might that have affected him? Could have been devastated. He was, he was initially really upset. But instead of getting depressed, he got angry. He activated another emotion. Because often, anger is an essential emotion to protect us, to deal with our fear or hurt, in this case, rejection. And what he told himself was, I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them. And he did, in terms of other things that he accomplished. He shifted his focus and, and was outstanding in several other areas, including music and, and other performing arts. But he assumed that the reason he didn't get the role was because the kid that got the role had brown hair and he had blonde hair. And so he said, well, I just didn't get it because I didn't have the right color hair. Now, you might call that rationalization Maybe. or self-deception. <laughs> but sometimes, as we shift our attitudes and beliefs and assumptions about an event, it changes the whole emotional consequence of that event. And if we internalize something negative, it tends to contribute to depression. In fact, the research is pretty clear. Individuals who attribute the negative things in life to themselves 
and believe that they're always going to be the same and that there's nothing that they can do about it tend to get really depressed. Individuals who believe that the negative things in life are due mostly to just kind of circumstance or bad luck and they're only going to be temporary, and they really only apply to this specific situation, not other situations, tend to be much happier. Living in a little bit of denial is kind of a healthy thing. Too much reality can sometimes contribute to uh, feelings of depression. And so we have to think about how we think about things and see if the way we're thinking about things might make a difference. Anyone have an example from your own experience, a disappointment or discouragement that you've been able to reframe and it changes your whole emotional experience? I can't think of anything specific, but I remember um, something with school I was really disappointed and I talked to my mom about it. And I remember her saying, well, you can't count on other people to make you feel better. You have to be your number one fan. And it kind of makes me think like this little bit of denial and like a healthy narcissism that don't rely on everyone else to tell you like, you're okay, you'll be fine. This is an, an abnormality in the situation, but it'll be all right after this. And so it kind of makes me think of like you said, healthy denial. Yeah. Do you remember that scene from The Help where Skeeter is talking to her nanny and she hasn't been asked to the senior prom and what does the nanny say to her are you gonna let those boys determine who you are or are you gonna determine who you are and what's gonna make you happy it just reframes the whole experience and as you remember the character in the, in the book and the movie Skeeter is pretty strong. She's a pretty assertive young woman and takes on a daunting task to challenge a whole system of prejudice. What impact did that exchange as a senior in high school make in shaping her life? So the formula, the ABCs, is we go to the feelings first. What is the event? How does that feel? What am I aware of? in my thought pattern that's contributing to my depression. Can I ruminate on that long enough to alter it and consider another possibility, another way to interpret that? Let's go with some questions that we can ask ourselves whenever we encounter a specific belief. Okay? And again, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a scenario and see if we can use this scenario to illustrate the point. Do you remember Conrad in Ordinary People? Academy Award winning film, perhaps produced before some of you were born. But anyway, it's a great, a great film. And Conrad is in high school. He goes sailing with his older brother, who's a super stud, popular jock. And the winds come up the sailboat capsizes and his brother drowns. He ends up in a psychiatric hospital after attempting suicide because he can't reconcile the loss of his brother. Okay? And so he ends up going to see a psychologist. And in that exchange, he discovers that he really has a hard time sharing his thoughts and feelings with anyone. His parents played by Mary Tyler Moore and Donald Sutherland, have this perfect family system. And so he doesn't feel like he can mess it up and has a hard time expressing himself. And so the therapist asks him, is there anyone that you could share with? And he remembers a young girl his age that was at the hospital when he was suicidal. And he calls her. And they go for a Coke. And as they're sitting in this little diner, he asks her, do you ever miss the hospital? And she says, no. He says, but that's where we were real. That's where we could talk. and That's where we could share. And she says, yeah, but that was the hospital. This is the real world. My question to you is, which is real? In a hospital setting where you're sharing openly and being really com completely honest, or the quote unquote real world where you've got a smile on your face all the time? Which world is real? So Conrad's pretty confused. 
And his friend says, oh, I got to go to drama practice. And she bops off. And he feels more depressed. <laughs> what happened in the exchange? What were some of his assumptions? John, you're shaking your head. He's assuming that she felt the same way that he did. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the really telling part of the exchange is when she looks at him with, with concern on her face, when he asks her if she's in therapy, and she goes, well, I was, but I'm not anymore because my dad told me that I'm the only person that can really solve my problems. But you see this look of confusion on her face. And you can tell that Conrad doesn't believe her and that she doesn't believe herself. And ultimately, if you follow the film, she's the one that ends up taking her life, whereas Conrad's the one that finds out what's to be discovered through his depression as he ruminates on the loss of his brother. So let's look at some of the questions we can ask ourselves and maybe some questions that Conrad can ask himself. First of all, as he thinks about his brother's death, what's the objective fact? His brother is dead. Now, one of the things we discover as we get Conrad to open up, if you're his therapist, is that what's the assumption, what's one of the assumptions that he's been making about his brother's death? It's his fault. It's his fault. Because he survived, and his brother, the buff one, didn't. Here's Conrad, the wimpy one. He lived, his brother died. So it must be my fault. Is that based on objective fact? No. Okay. Another question we have to ask ourselves when we have maybe an irrational belief or assumption is, does it protect me from harm? Anybody afraid of spiders? <laughs> really, does that protect you from harm? In my belief, yes. Yes, it does, but no, not in reality. <laughs> so you've never died of a spider bite? I have not. And do you know anyone that has died of a spider bite? No, I don't. So probably that belief or assumption, that irrational fear, isn't keeping you from harm, and it's certainly not based on objective fact. Does it help you avoid conflict when you freak out in front of your husband? Or <laughs> uh, Probably not. I don't think it. We don't really have a conflict about it, but okay. maybe he likes to feel like, oh, I'm protecting my wife. That's right. Maybe it does <laughs> facilitate or enable your fear. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but in Conrad's case, does his self-condemnation and belief that he's the cause of his brother's death uh, protect him from harm? No, he tried to kill himself. And does it help him avoid conflict? Not at all. His friends are frustrated with him. His parents are really in conflict with him because of this ongoing depression. Does it help him with his goals? Does it promote any, any of his goal accomplishment? Not at all. In fact, he quit the swim team. You know, he's not doing well academically, and he's not doing nearly as well socially as he did before the accident. And does it have any kind of desirable emotion attached to it? Probably not. So if we have to answer no to all those questions, then we may want to challenge those beliefs or assumptions that keep fueling our depression. And we may want to try a belief system that helps us face the facts, keeps us from harm, reduces conflict, allows us to accomplish our goals, and helps us feel the way we want to feel. So let's look at a simple experiment. Does everybody have an irrational belief? You don't have to disclose to the group. Does everybody have one that you can ponder for just a moment? If you need one, I can share several with you. <laughs> All right. So what I want you to do is just ask yourself, who's responsible for that belief? And, and if we can be completely honest, it's usually a function of I'm responsible for my assumptions and beliefs. Taking responsibility for the way we think and feel is, is huge. Because so many times we want to point the finger and blame circumstance for how we feel rather than owning our emotions. Um, what is it that contributes to that emotion? Is it okay to ask, Matt? What is it that contributes to the emotion? Yeah, what is it about your belief that contributes to how you're feeling? Uh, I think, you know, I guess past experiences and past, um, I guess, similar situations where I've had, mm -hmm. 
you know, similar beliefs and feelings. I mean, that's kind of what I kind of draw on. Um, yeah, yeah. And if you remember, does everybody remember the kid with Bruce Willis? And how he's got this twitch? How does he discover the root of his twitch? He goes back to his eight-year-old self. Well, actually, his eight-year-old self appears in his life, much to his consternation, because he thinks his eight-year-old self is disgusting, even though his girlfriend thinks his eight-year-old self is much cuter than he is. And she helps him to discover that there's something important to be learned from his eight-year-old self. And symbolically, that's probably true of all of us. There's usually something from our past experience that reinforces these artificial beliefs that are getting in the way. Now, in this case, he was able to go back to that eighth birthday, and what did he discover? First, he thought he had to beat up the bully on the playground, right? And that if he could just beat up the bully, then he'd be past his fear and his twitch. But he discovers that it was much more significant than that. That was the day that he found out that his mother was dying of cancer. You know, it's a tender scene as his father is shaking him. Grow up! Stop crying. Stop feeling. You're going to kill your mother. Well, ouch. <laughs> when we have those, those thoughts, those beliefs, those assumptions, I'm killing my mother. And for an eight-year-old, that becomes a very real belief, a powerful belief. I'm not allowed to feel. I'm not allowed to show emotion. I've got to stifle all my emotional experience. So we have to ask, well, who's responsible for that? We could blame the dad, or we could blame God for taking mom at, you know, before I turn nine. We could blame all these circumstances, the bully on the playground. But if we own it and figure out what it is and how it's affecting us, now we have options. What else could he believe? I don't remember this movie, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. The dad lashed out in anger. That the dad was scared. That he didn't know how to deal with his own loss of his wife. And he didn't know how he was going to raise a little boy by himself. And so out of fear, he shook him and said all these things that are not true. And that's really what we do, isn't it? We challenge those assumptions from the past, whether it's about spiders or a dying mother or whatever it is that's your irrational belief. We challenge those assumptions and we start to believe something new. Okay, so the simple experiment. Are you ready? Deep breath in through your nose. Out through the mouth. And as you focus on your breathing, see if you can breathe through your tummy like the baby does. Not so much from your chest. And as your breathing slows down, see if you can imagine back to that moment in time before you were in college, maybe all the way back to your childhood, where you started to develop that false belief, that assumption that as an adult you know is incorrect. Spiders aren't going to kill you. You're about 50,000 times bigger than they are. Whatever it is, that false belief. And see if you can own it, understand the purpose that it serves, and see if there are ways to modify it. In whatever way makes sense to you, to be able to say to yourself, the truth is you didn't kill your mother. You're stronger than a spider. You're able to survive this disappointment of not being selected for the performing band. There will be other opportunities in your life. There's another way to think through this that will contribute to my happiness. I'm thankful for this depression it helps me to see the situation more honestly, more clearly, more effectively.
when you've challenged that false belief and replaced it with the truth. See if you can store that away in your head as well as in your heart. So that any time you start to believe that false assumption, all you have to do is take a deep breath and remind yourself the truth is Now open your eyes. Anybody have a successful moment replacing a false assumption with the truth? John, is it too private to share? Yeah, sometimes I, uh, well, just the, just, the, just the experience of slowing down and breathing was really helpful for me. Um, it allowed me to separate myself a little bit from my thoughts and emotions and kind of get in touch with the truer part of me. Nice. But, uh, but yeah, sometimes I, you know, because I'm always being challenged academically, um, sometimes I don't feel like I'm as smart as I should be. And, you know, but allowing some of that distance between me and that thought allows me to, um, allows me to feel like, you know, I've done okay so far and my track record's pretty good and I shouldn't let that make me so sad or, or get down on myself. Nice. So sometimes we can look at the bigger picture and not just the one failure or the one challenge, but we can look at our overall track record. That's a great example. I think if we can give ourselves permission to experiment with our thinking after we've paid attention to our emotions, then we can do something different. You mentioned earlier that it really helps to do some things differently, but one of the challenges with depression is sometimes it's hard to conjure up the energy. So if you look at that second handout, let's talk about just 10 simple experiments, behavioral experiments. After we've admitted our emotions and sat with our thoughts, and challenge some of the irrational ones, then let's consider one of the following. And as you look over the list, as we talk about it, I want you to think about which of these 10 ideas makes the most sense for me now. Okay? What makes the most sense? For example, do you expose yourself to daylight every day? Or as a student, do you spend all your time in the basement of the library? Something about vitamin D, little sunshine. And even in Cache Valley, when we have inversion for a week or two in January or February, it's getting up to Beaver Mountain so you can expose yourself to some daylight or have full spectrum lighting in your kitchen that's really essential. It's hard to exercise. And sometimes we need to have an exercise partner to get us going, even if it's just walking, playing a little racquetball. I'm fortunate that for the last 23 years, one of my office mates plays racquetball with me in the winter, tennis in the summer, we go golfing together. So almost every day he pokes his head in my office, so are we on for today? Many days it would be easy to say, oh, I'm too busy, but because I know he's counting on me, I'm not going to let him down. Sure, let's go. Having a partner makes all the difference in having that endorphin release from exercise. Um, Sometimes we need to uh, have that simple relaxation strategy of noticing what's in the room, noticing what's in our happy place, uh, having a roots and branches exercise. One of the workshops that you can sign up for next is a mindfulness training workshop or effective coping strategies where you can practice relaxation and mindfulness. Uh, how many of you eat well? Did you eat breakfast today? Yes. <laughs> yes. Breakfast. Okay. So just that simple balanced diet makes all the difference. Let's see. There we go. All right. Let's look at a couple others. Let's look at five key questions that you can ask yourself to facilitate the practice of some of these strategies. Um, oops. 
Let's go backwards. There we go. All right. If I know that I'm focusing more on positive emotions, that I'm engaged in life and have meaningful relationships, then I probably have a reason for getting out of bed. And I achieve more. It shows the importance of relationships. Can you all think of one person that you could account to each day? Angela, who might that be? Who are you going to report the three good things that happen at the end of each day? Um, my boyfriend. Excellent. John? My wife? Um, my friend. I also keep a journal and I just Excellent. write three down. So. Yeah, so journaling can be powerful. My husband. My wife. So you have significant people in your life and that's huge. Okay, It helps you to find that balance of power and status, that feeling that what you do will make a difference and that you are important. It's shifting your focus from your deficits to your strengths. One of the sites that I would encourage you to visit is happiness.org. Okay, happiness.org. And you can go there and take their survey and identify your strengths so that becomes your focus. You can practice listening expanding your network of support, finding a purpose, the power of doing a little bit of service. You all know that doing an act of kindness for other reduces your, sure. your cortisol levels, which is a function of stress, and increases your endorphins. Just saying hello to somebody on the bus as you come up to campus will reduce your cortisol, increase your endorphins. And focusing on three good things that happen um, really makes a difference. So let's summarize those tips. Have you decided which of those works best for you of those 10 things? Matt, what do you think of those 10 ideas? Which one makes most sense to you? I think for me, definitely the exercise. I mean, I notice when I get really busy, Exercise is hard to come by, but when I'm consistently getting that exercise, then it's really good for my body and my concentration, and I feel better. Perfect. Okay. Really? I care for the living. I have two dogs, and so that makes me really engaged and having fun, playful, all that. Nice. Um, artistic expression, I think. I love to play the piano, and I love music, so those are yes. things that really help me. And it's much cheaper than therapy. Yeah. <laughs> Service for me, I, I get a lot of meaning and fulfillment out of trying to help other people. Nice. Angela? I'd say a combination of the sunshine and exercise, hiking and working out on the horse ranch, both do that for me. Beautiful. So that's my challenge to you, to take one of these 10 ideas and practice it each day, whether it's the same idea or a different one. Catch a few rays. Enjoy a little exercise. Balance your diet. Meditate. Socialize. Um, journal. Play the piano. Take care of something or someone. Uh, get involved in a service project. And if you have a higher power, turn it over. I mean, if you're too in touch with the reality of life and all the harsh things that happen in the world, and you've no place to let go of all that, something that's bigger than you, you believe in, it can be pretty overwhelming. But if you can turn it over to your higher power, to the universe, instead of carrying that around with you, it lightens your load. That's my challenge to you. Practice the things that make a difference. Discover the joy of depression. See how it impacts you. Um, do we have time to summarize what you've learned today? Matt, what have you learned today? Um, yeah, there's just there's a lot of different ways to think about depression, and there's a lot of different factors that contribute to it. But um, definitely the way that you kind of perceive what's going on and again those events in our lives that happen the way that we perceive and and again the hope that we can bring to that or the you know the ways that we can empower ourselves to not get stuck there then I think that can really make a difference as far as our happiness and and dealing with depression when it does come I think that can really be important super early um, I think like the perception of depression and how what that means to me in my life can make a big difference on how I'm going to deal with it, what I'm going to do to help get out of that depression or use it for me to move forward in life. So I think that was a big, and then a little bit of denial is good. I think that was a nice thing to learn too. Indeed. 
Um, I really like the idea of just thinking about what you can learn from this, from the experience of feeling depressed and learning that you're strong enough to deal with it or to get through it. Um, like just taking um, something that's happened and turning it into something good, like, you know, that experience I mentioned. Learning, okay, well, I shouldn't talk myself down so much. Helped me the next time I tried out, and I Beautiful. did much better. So, yeah, just Great learning example. from it. Thank you. I'm with the others. I think depression might feel awful, but it's an opportunity to do an inventory, to look at your thoughts, your behaviors, and to improve your life in ways that bring you more joy. So you just have to pay attention to it and harness it and then good things could come from it. Nice. And I think for me, having these kind of, these 10 things that you can try out is the most useful thing yeah. for me. Something that's concrete I can do when I feel down. Thanks for committing to do that. Mm -hmm. So in the words of the Abbey, all life can be summarized in these two words. Wait and hope. Wait and hope. Thank you very much for spending time today.